definitely not the way I planned Axel traveling in the car. <laughs> Extraordinarily dangerous. Good morning, everybody. So I'm driving to work and I'm thinking about something that just you know, kind of pops into my head. Uh, I was at a continued education seminar this weekend. Uh, Dr. Axel was with me and everybody was very impressed with how unbelievably well behaved he is. And a question I constantly get asked is, you know, who trained him, who trained him, or did you train him? And the answer is, yeah, like I trained Dr. Axel. Yes, I, you know, always look, um, you know, to professional people for advice if I think that there's a certain thing that a dog will do, which, you know, doesn't quite fit the mold. Because I had, you know, three dogs over 21 years, two of which were very well trained, but the third, uh, Marlo, my pit bull, who passed away last year, he was not a good dog. Like, he never really was that well trained. And, uh, when people ask me about, you know, Dr. Axel, I just tell them the truth, which is he just inherently gets it. He's just a good dog and he, he understands, you know, what I'm asking for him via body language and my mood and my signals and yes, now the commands. And the way that, that I like to chalk that up to is, you know, there's a genetic component that makes him so good and it's not just because he's got poodle in him or Yorkies are so smart. I've seen plenty of dumb Yorkshire Terriers. I've seen plenty of dumb toy poodles. And, you know, what it is is there's, you know, again, a genetic component, which people are just inherently, you know, born with something that makes them good at something that makes them not so good at something. They have to kind of find their niche, right? And then there's the environmental things that happen. You know, I could look at and say, well, in the environment that, you know, Dr. Axel was raised in, he had every reason to become a great dog because he was with me so much. We're constantly talking to him. We're constantly encouraging him. We're constantly disciplining him, disciplining him. So again, there's those environmental factors too. Now I've had other dogs where environmentally I've done what I thought was the best to train them, to discipline them, to encourage them. And they did not turn out as good as Dr. Axel. So what does that mean and how does that apply to your health? Well, what it means is inherently we are born with certain things that we do really well and we are born with other things that we don't do well. And obviously there are genetic components. And when we think about why some of us are healthy and why some of us don't seem to be as healthy or why some of us are in pain or the other ones not in pain, why some of us have a little arthritis or others don't, you see where I'm going with this? Yeah, there is a genetic component, but environment pulls the trigger. This must be understood there is like this what they call epigenetics uh component to things and you know you could really mess up you know going down the road to when somebody is you know has a predisposition to something that might be within the genetics but obviously you know if you uh, i guess we could say reinforce these good qualities and these good traits then you will have probably not just the dog you desired in this case, right? But the health in what you desire as well. And if you enable some of the bad things that you're born with, if you enable and embrace and just make it an excuse and a reason as to why you're not healthy, it will fail you miserably. It will be the scapegoat to which you consistently use and consistently uh, make excuses for, and it will hinder your ability to thrive as a human. And that is my two cents this morning. And, you know, if you have any questions to how this may apply to you, I can see if I can come up with what I believe are life hacks. You know, Dr. Axel this morning gets to be the, the ultimate example so he can feel uh, good about himself and go on about his day. So there it is. Until next time, guys, it's Dr. Perlman.